Pearl Harbor, monitoring the reports of more major Japanese naval units approaching Guadalcanal, Admiral Nimitz sent a broadcast to all task force commanders, bracingly stating the obvious. The sea with an implacable ease. Halsey well understood the risks of sending Willis Lee's two big ships to set an ambush in Savo Sound. The plan flouted one of the firmest doctrines of the Naval War College, Halsey would write. The narrow, treacherous waters north of Guadalcanal are utterly unsuited to the manoeuvring of capital ships, especially in darkness. But the big ships were all he had left. The Washington and the South Dakota were not sisters, but close cousins, part of the surge in new major ship construction that followed the expiration of the 1930 London Naval Treaty's five-year-long building holiday. The construction of the big new ships was politically risky for President Roosevelt during the pinchpenny, isolationist-minded years after the Great Depression. He waited until after the 1936 elections to authorise the Washington's construction. The Navy's general board never seemed sure what it was willing to sacrifice in order to meet the limits imposed by treaty limitations on battleship displacement. Its preferred designs changed as frequently as its membership did. In the end, Lee's two battleships were the product of a decision to emphasise superior firepower. The two ships each carried a 16-inch main battery that fired a 2,700-pound projectile. More than ten times the weight of the 8-inch round fired by a heavy cruiser, these heavier weapons changed the calculus of warship architecture, and in turn, tactical doctrine as well. Though it was customary to design battleships to withstand hits from their own projectiles, the Washington did not have armour stout enough to defeat the heavy new 16-inch ordnance. The South Dakota's side armour could take such a hit from beyond 20,000 yards, but only because her designers had compromised her ability to survive torpedoes. Rushed to the South Pacific soon after their commissionings, neither ship was put through the usual round of sea trials prior to deployment. But there was widespread confidence in them nonetheless, and the ships were more than a match for Japanese battleships such as the Kirishima, with a 14-inch main battery. Aside from the short time they had operated together with the Enterprise Task Force, the Washington and the South Dakota had never been in each other's company. While Admiral Lee repeatedly drilled his gunnery and director crews in aiming their guns and finding targets, neither ship had much experience actually firing her big weapons. The Washington had only fired her main battery twice at night, both times in January 1942. Nighttime gunnery experience was scanter still on the South Dakota. She had fired her main battery three times, but never at night. Though the ships were state-of-the-art, the state of their live-fire experience was far less than that of the old battleships sidelined on the west coast. The Colorado conducted ten main battery live-fire exercises between July and November. Lee's four destroyers had never operated together either. The first time the South Dakota's main battery was tested with a full nine-gun broadside, the wave of blast pressure pushed through the passageway where Captain Thomas Gatch was standing, tearing his pants right off him. The vast power of the 16-inch guns required a perfect physical apparatus to ensure not only their working order, but also the safety of the ship. The bomb that exploded atop Turret 1 during the air attacks of October 25 had gouged two barrels of Turret 2, which jutted out over the bomb's impact point. A lieutenant junior grade who served in the turret, Paul H. Bacchus, said, As you can imagine, we made all kinds of measurements and sent messages back to the Bureau of Ordnance in Washington, describing these gouges, their depth, their length, and asked the question, Can we shoot these barrels? We never did get an answer that we could live with. Finally, word came back that turret 2's centre and left guns were not to be fired. This powerful but patchwork group, Task Force 64, was Lee's first seagoing flag command. What he may have lacked in combat experience, he had made up for through the rigorous study of the practical problems of combat in the radar age. Having served as director of fleet training just before the war, he was one of the first naval officers to build a career on the wonkery of modern wave physics. The lingo of transmitters, receivers, double lobe systems and ring oscillators was like speaking in tongues to most officers. Imperturbable and capable of solving multiple lines of variables as they shifted, Lee was reputed to know the intricacies of radar systems better than their own operators did. According to Admiral Kincaid, a close friend and classmate, 
He was not what you would describe as a military figure. He was without the straight, taut carriage that that description would imply. Lee walked pigeon-toed and was hard of sight. At Annapolis, he fretted the physical examination, memorizing the first two lines of the eye chart. A native of Owen County, Kentucky, he was known back home as Mose, but would acquire a more worldly nickname, Ching, for his fondness for the Asiatic theater. According to Ernest M. Eller, a subordinate of Lee's at the Fleet Training Division, he looked like an Arkansas farmer, a little like Will Rogers. Early in his career, a destroyer he commanded suffered from a rat infestation. Tired of seeing the rodents scurrying across the wardroom's overhead beams, Lee fashioned a trap consisting of a solenoid mechanism and an armature attached to a meat cleaver. Delighted with the contraption, his officers diverted themselves with this minor blood sport, competing to see whose reflexes were quick enough to pull the lever and chop the stowaway rodents in two. Lee's understanding of gunnery was world-class. In 1907, at age 19, he became the only American at the time to win both the U.S. National High Power Rifle and Pistol Championships in the same year. In April 1914, during the U.S. intervention in Vera Cruz, Mexico, his landing force from the battleship New Hampshire came under fire. Wielding a borrowed rifle, Lee assumed a sitting position out in the open, drawing fire to locate enemy muzzle flashes and killed three enemy snipers at long range. After such a performance in combat, the Olympics were hardly a test of nerves. At the age of 32, he was a member of the US rifle team that won seven medals, including five golds, at the 1920 Antwerp Summer Games. Lee understood the powerful weapons of a battleship not as specialized naval instruments, but as extensions of the universal laws of ballistics that he had wholly absorbed by the time he took command. Most surface officers were obsessive students of gunnery, but few adapted their expertise to an age of new technology. Lee did so by conducting fire control drills under odd conditions, sometimes requiring turrets be manned by relief crews instead of the first team, and throwing unexpected twists at them, randomly cutting out electrical connections to the mounts and scrambling their links to the fire control radars, forcing his men to rely on backup systems or local control. Afterward, he gathered with Captain Glenn B. Davis, his gunnery officer, Commander H.T. Walsh, and a coterie of young officers, where his principal theorist, Ed Hooper, would run through the mathematics late into the night. His conversation was so loaded with calculi and abelian equations, a historian wrote, that sometimes Commander Walsh and Captain Davis would begin to look slightly helpless. That said a lot, seeing as Davis had served as the experimental officer at the Dahlgren Naval Proving Grounds, testing guns, armour, powder and projectiles, and later served as chief of the gun section at the Bureau of Ordnance. Lee knew that the key to victory lay not only in terms of engineering or mathematics, but in a crew's ability to adjust psychologically to the unexpected. Said Lloyd Mustin, It doesn't take long to learn these things a few hours. Learn the basics in a few hours and then start thinking in those terms day in and day out. Not everyone seemed able or willing to take the time. Willis Lee, like Norman Scott, took the time. He worked endlessly, late into the night, before unwinding with a few pages from a detective novel and falling asleep in his clothes a few hours before breakfast. News of an inbound battleship force commanded Lee's attention. Late in the afternoon on November 14, he received a report that the submarine Trout had sighted large enemy units southbound about 150 miles north of Guadalcanal. The Tokyo Express, though operating with changing rosters of ships and commanders, was keeping to its well-established timetable of midnight arrivals. While the Cactus Air Force was preoccupied with hammering Tanaka's transports that afternoon, Kondo's heavy surface force, the Kirishima joined by the heavy cruisers Atago and Takao, had avoided daylight air attack. It would be up to Lee's surface task force to stop them, Halsey had given him complete freedom of action after his arrival in the waters off Guadalcanal. Japanese search planes had sighted Lee when he was still a hundred miles south of Guadalcanal, but failed to recognise his principal vessels as battleships. They reported Task Force 64 as composed of two cruisers and four destroyers. Later, Kondo dismissed a report of a carrier and possibly some battleships some 50 miles south of the island on grounds that they were not in position to intercept him that night.
Like the men in Tanaka's transport force, Kondo was confident that the bombardment by the cruisers Suzuya and Maya the previous night had put down the Guadalcanal aviators. He had little idea what was in store for him. As Task Force 64 approached the island's western shore, the captain of the Washington, Glenn Davis, walked into the chart house and pressed the button on the ship's intercom. This is the captain speaking. We are going into an action area. We have no great certainty what forces we will encounter. We might be ambushed. A disaster of some sort may come upon us. But whatever it is we are going into, I hope to bring all of you back alive. Good luck to all of us. After the epic dust-ups of the previous two nights, the men on the islands around Savo Sound had learned to expect fireworks after dark. Willis Lee slugged north toward collision, aiming to oblige them. Savo Sound was quiet. Off the port bows of Lee's ships, the skies and calm waters were gently lit by flashes on the horizon. The gunfire from Tanaka's transport group as it resisted the last wave of aircraft from Henderson Field. As night fell, a quarter moon reclined overhead, and the orange glow of fires warmed the western horizon. The fires of burning ships, trophies for the busy pilots of the Cactus Air Force. None of this soothed the battleship sailors as they cruised at 18 knots, prows easing through the sea. The sight of land nearby kept their nerves on edge. Appreciating the need for operating space, Lee had arranged his destroyers, the walkie leading the Benham, Preston and Gwyn, nearly three miles ahead of the battleships, which themselves were separated by nearly a mile. The men in the big ships craved sea room. All we can do is trust in God and our surveys, and the surveys are not much good, wrote a South Dakota chaplain, James Vitt Claypool. He tried to play chess with another officer, but found he couldn't concentrate. Lee checked in with Guadalcanal's radio station, known as Cactus Control, for the latest dope. His own radio department had heard Japanese voices on the air, but couldn't translate them for want of an interpreter on board. Indeed, the intelligence setup was one of the continuing weaknesses of the South Pacific Area Command. No reliable coordination yet existed between the commanders on the island and the naval forces they relied on for defence. Neither Captain Greenman, the commander of naval activities, nor General Vandergrift was regularly apprised of the movements of friendly ships. As Lee awaited a reply from Cactus Control, there came a mysterious dispatch from an unidentified sender, one that Captain Dubose of the Portland, still moored to a palm tree in the shadows of Tulagi, would have understood all too well. They go two big ones, but I don't know whose they are. The intercepted words belonged to the skipper of a PT boat, lurking in shadow. Lee raised Guadalcanal again and warned them off. Refer your big boss about Ching Li. Chinese. Kachi? Call off your boys. The warning seemed to register. Another episode, like the near torpedoing of the Portland, would have had dire consequences for the mosquito boat drivers. By 10.30, Lee was cutting a clockwise arc about 20 miles north of Savo Island, with his sweeping radar beams revealing no contacts, he passed near the gravesite of the Hie, over the wrecks of the Vincennes, the Quincy and the Astoria, then re-entered Savo Sound to cruise over the seafloor where the Atlanta lay. As the task force came around to a westerly heading and steamed toward Cape Esperance, the navigators and helmsmen of the task force noticed that their magnetic compass needles were twitching and spinning. Magnetic interference was straightforward enough an explanation. Some thought the dead ships of Iron Bottom Sound were reaching out with an inscrutable message. Faithfully motoring in circles as it cast its 10 centimeter microwaves, the Washington's SG radar spied the enemy ships to the north of northwest as they left the cover of Savo Island making 21 knots. The radars watched the enemy vessels for several minutes at a range of 18,000 yards, sharing their data on human wavelengths via the PPI scope and to the mechanical fire control computer that delivered calculus to the gun turrets, before losing track of the contacts because of interference from land. The radars were sketching a picture, definite in range and bearing if indistinct in composition, of two groups of enemy ships north of Savo Island. Admiral Lee and Captain Davis had designed the Washington's fire control procedures around the fact that this type of data was essential to everything, they made sure that their radar plot officer did not operate the traditional way, communicating through a sailor who served as his talker.
Instead, he was wired up with his own headset to speak directly to the gunnery officer, the main battery plotting room officer, and the trainers in each of the gun director stations, all at the same time. In this way, he could describe the appearance of the scope and designate targets directly to all stations with a need to know, with less confusion. With a Philip Morris hanging from his lips, Willis Lee said to Davis, Well, stand by, Glenn, here they come. In every compartment of the Washington, an electronic bell gave two short rings, signalling a warning that a salvo was imminent. Hydraulic hoists trundled 2,700-pound projectiles up from the magazines to the turrets. The powder cars whisked up silk cylindrical bags filled with explosive propellant. The projectiles were eased mechanically onto the heavy bronze breech-loading trays and the powder bags laid in behind them, as many as eight per load depending on the range to the target. After the breech had been rammed and locked, the gun captain hit the ready light indicating the gun was ready to fire. Admiral Kondo had arrayed his force in three groups, consisting of the Kirishima and the cruisers Atago and Takao, his bombardment unit was his centrepiece. Ahead of those large ships went his screening unit, the light cruiser Nagara leading six destroyers, commanded by Rear Admiral Susumu Kimura. Off to the east steamed a separate sweeping unit made up of the light cruiser Sendai and three destroyers under Rear Admiral Shintaro Hashimoto. It was this latter group that Lee's radars detected first as the Washington and South Dakota plunged along on their westerly heading, tracing a course south of Savo Island. On the radar scope, the Washington's radar plot officer watched the light echoes separate from the mass of Savo Island, then separate into drops similar to the effect of planes taking off from a carrier. The Washington's turrets trained to starboard and fixed on Hashimoto's group as it approached on the east side of Savo Island, sliding aft relative to the battleships as they moved west. At 11.13pm, when main battery control reported to Lee that the narrow-casting fire control radars had found targets and were yielding ranges, Lee hailed Gatch over the TBS and gave the South Dakota permission to open fire. It was not until the enemy vessels were spotted visually, at 18,500 yards, that the Washington, followed closely by the South Dakota, let loose. For the second time in three nights, Savo Sound erupted in thunder and light. Ensign Robert B. Reed of the Preston watched the mighty flagship astern. As the corona of the Washington's first broadside faded, he could follow the nine red tracers as they flew away, grouped together for all the world like a flight of airplanes, he said. Reed watched the salvo disappear up into the low-hanging clouds, then re-emerge ten miles downrange. When the fire control radar received echoes that showed the first salvo had landed over, beyond its target, the plotting officer checked his headphone chin strap. The concussion of the big guns sent more than a few headsets clattering to the deck, then instructed the gunnery officer, Commander H.T. Walsh, to spot down, lowering the elevation of the gun. The second salvo, fired 45 seconds later, registered a straddle. The officers watching the radars knew their fire was on target when they saw the radar image of the target flicker at the moment of impact. After the two battleships commenced fire, Radio snoopers in the South Dakota heard a cacophony of Japanese voices, excited and very numerous. They counted at least 13 stations on this frequency at one time. Though the South Dakota's main battery was hamstrung, with just four guns working in her two forward triple turrets, she continued her cannonade until her forward turrets, swinging aft to remain on target, bumped up against the stops that kept her from firing into her own superstructure. The after turret, with no such restraints, kept firing, however, and as it trained straight aft, the wash of fire from her barrels set fire to her two float planes, fantail mounted on catapults. The small bonfires raged briefly before the next salvo blew them right off the ship. The light cruiser Sendai and the destroyers Shikinami and Uranami were the objects of this large calibre fury. Though Hashimoto's small squadron was engulfed in that maelstrom, not one of his ships was actually hit. The sweeping unit commander, the first Japanese naval officer to take fire from 16-inch guns, ordered his captains to lay a smokescreen, of little benefit against a radar-guided foe, and reverse course to seek other opportunities to sweep. Surrounded by towering splashes, the captains of the Japanese ships, making smoke, beat a high-speed retreat. The Washington's secondary battery cracked ferociously away as well, 
with the two forward 5-inch mounts shooting at the main battery's targets, and the next two mounts aft firing on a cruiser that appeared to be illuminating the South Dakota. The after-dual 5-inch mount lofted star shells. The intense flash of the 5-inch fusillades blinded his main battery director, operators and turret captains as they looked out through their night scopes. But fighting by eyesight was the old way of war. Now the human senses were an auxiliary system. Radar has forced the captain or OTC to base a greater part of his actions in a night engagement on what he is told rather than what he can see, Lee would write. Coolly deciding which directors would control which turrets and switching them as the geometry of the engagement shifted, Willis Lee became the first naval commander to manage a gunfight mostly by radar remote control. Using the picture his radar provided him, Lee could see his four destroyers ahead and monitor the shifting geometry of the landmasses around him. He had a fine view of the naval landscape. What he did not have, owing to an oversight in ship design, was an electronic picture of the situation to his rear. With his radar transmitters bolted to the front side of the tower foremast, he could register no returns through a 60-degree arc astern. The South Dakota was in that blind spot. Without visual contact with the other battleship, he was susceptible to the same uncertainty that clouded the view of Scott and Callahan in the previous surface engagements in Savo Sound. Lee could no longer be completely sure that large targets on his radar were hostile. Lee's battleships were the first ships that night to make their powerful presence felt, but in short order the destroyers in his van were grappling with the enemy and suffering the consequences of the collision. At about 11.30pm, the lead vessel, the Walke, located a target on her starboard beam at 15,000 yards. It was a lone enemy ship, the destroyer Ayanami, which had strayed from Hashimoto's formation and was winding a course west of Savo Island alone. As the ship closed on their starboard hand, the walk opened fire with her five-inch guns. Five minutes later, lookouts in Commander Max Storms's Preston, third in line, spotted the Nagara ahead, leading four destroyers of the screening unit and opened fire on her at 7,500 yards. The Walkie and the Benham, Preston and Gwyn turned their fire on these ships ahead. The walk's captain, Thomas E. Fraser, had a hard time seeing his target, the Ayanami, given how closely the enemy destroyer was hugging Savo's shore. His radar could see the target only when it was far enough from land to return a separate echo. The Ayanami's captain had no plans to allow that to happen. From the cover of the dark shoreline, around 11.30, he fired torpedoes at the American van and reversed course away from the action. The torpedoes were on their way. Enemy gunfire was faster in arriving. By the light of a setting quarter moon flirting with low clouds, the Preston opened fire on another ship, the light cruiser Nagara, in the loom of Savo Island. Steaming at 23 knots, Stormer's ship found a hitting range at 9,000 yards, when she was struck hard by a pair of 5.5-inch shells that plunged into her machinery spaces from the starboard side, killing everyone in her two fire rooms. The blast propelled a filthy cloud of fire brick and debris out of the stacks that settled all across the amidships area. Shattered torpedo warheads leaked TNT that quickly caught fire. The ship's afterstack fell across a searchlight installation, knocking it over onto the starboard torpedo tube. A heavier hit followed as a strange ship, which the Preston's officers would speculate was a Japanese heavy cruiser, approached from the port side of the American column and fired on the destroyer. One large shell entered the engine room, exploding against the electrical generators. Another hit near the number three gun, and a third was a direct hit on the number four. The blast was so great that it jammed guns one and two all the way forward. Aft of the stacks, the Preston's decks were a blazing ruin. Captain Storms was forced to give the order to abandon ship almost immediately. However, to the executive officer of the South Dakota, Commander A.E. Eulinger, and another officer, Henry Stewart, it was clear that the Preston was a victim of friendly fire. I saw the Washington open fire to her starboard, Stewart said. To us it looked as if the Washington's fire had caused the accident. The action reports would lend credence to the idea that even Willis Lee was susceptible to making deadly mistakes in the heat of battle. As the Preston coasted to a stop, the walkie was hit too.
Captain Fraser was working to set up a torpedo solution at a large target to starboard when the enemy fish arrived. One struck the walkie forward of the bridge, lifting the forward half of the ship bodily out of the water, the action report read. As the destroyer crashed back into the sea without a bow forward of the bridge superstructure, one of the ship's magazines detonated and its explosion ruptured forward fuel oil tanks and tore holes in the superstructure decks. A few seconds later, several medium-caliber warheads slammed into the ship, blowing away a swath of her forecastle and forward superstructure decking. Across the main deck surged a flood of fuel oil several inches deep. Flames roared through the forward compartments. Very quickly it became clear that the walker was going down by the bow. When machine gun ammunition started popping, and the forward bulkhead of the fire room finally buckled, Fraser decided to abandon ship. The severed bow floated on as the stern sank. Minutes later, the survivors in the water were rocked by an undersea blast, as the ship's depth charges exploded to grievous effect in their company. The dead included Captain Fraser. The walk's dead would number 82 men, including six of her officers. The Benham, behind the walkie, briefly took the lead before a shell plunged into her fire room. Then a torpedo struck, a Type 90 fish probably fired by the Ayanami. It carried away about 50 feet of the Benham's bow below the main deck. The blast produced no fatalities, but sent a tall column of hot seawater soaring toward the stars. When it came back down, it washed heavily over the length of the ship, causing injuries topside and carrying a man overboard. Then another shower fell on the Benham, oil and debris from the explosion on board the Preston ahead. The Benham continued along at ten knots. The Gwyn, riding in the van's rear, popped star shells, illuminating the coast of Savo, where flashes of gunfire were visible. Her torpedo crew had a solution on a cruiser, but a short circuit caused a torpedo to fire prematurely, well out of range. Then the Gwyn, too, started absorbing shells, taking a hit in the engine room. A failure in her safety circuits caused three torpedoes to release from their tubes and slide harmlessly overboard. The Gwyn came right to avoid the dying Preston and continued on her westerly course. The Benham's captain, Lieutenant Commander John B. Taylor, saw the trouble ahead and decided to steer clear of the damaged ships and the churn of enemy gunfire. Turning hard right, he made a half circle and steadied up, heading east until the Washington passed on an opposite course. Circling back around, Taylor, seeing the burning walk and Preston, planned to stop and recover survivors. When the two cripples came under fire again, he elected, however, to withdraw. It was around this time, at about 11.33pm, that the South Dakota suffered an appalling systems failure. Her after turret had just lashed out at a target off the starboard bow when Captain Gatch's ship was seized as if by an aneurysm, a short circuit in her main switchboard. As the breakers tripped out in the switchboards that served her secondary battery, only to find that they had been tied down by the chief engineer, the overload surged to other switches, creating a collapsing house of cards within the ship's power grid. In an instant, the great battleship went dark. Gone were her gyros and all her fire control equipment. As the battleship's main battery fell silent, there was nothing Gatch could do to his enemy but curse. When the Washington turned left and passed the burning destroyers on their disengaged side, hidden from the enemy by their fires, she entered waters dense with flotsam and survivors. Making twenty-six knots through the debris field of the stricken walk and Preston, the battleship's sailors threw life rafts overboard. From the ranks of bobbing heads they heard cries of encouragement. Get after them, Washington! Captain Gatch in the South Dakota tried to follow the Washington as she passed on the disengaged hand of the destroyers, but when a wreck of a destroyer loomed, threatening collision, he was forced to turn the other way, conning sharply right, passing between the walk and Preston and the enemy. The manoeuvre placed his blinded warship in an unfortunate tactical position, silhouetted by the burning wrecks and plainly visible to an enemy hungry for targets. Three minutes after her switchboard failure, power returned to the ship, the outage was long enough to disorient one of the two most powerful ships in Savo Sound that night, and the confusion that reigned led to a tactical error in ship handling that would draw concentrated enemy attention in the coming minutes. The heavy toll inflicted on the four leading ships of the American column was the pattern set by previous engagements. Destroyers, always expendable, had sacrificed themselves in faithful adherence to duty.
Seeing the plight of his leading foursome, Willis Lee excused his van from battle, ordering the Benham and the Gwyn to retire. The Washington and South Dakota would carry this fight alone. In the Washington, the detonation of the Walk's depth charges could be felt like a speed bump under tread. The battleship, whose five-inch guns helped batter the Iron Army to a powerless, burning hulk, had to cease firing her secondary battery now for fear of hitting friendly destroyers. For his part, Kondo was eager to send his two smaller groups to tangle with the Americans, but he was cautious and hesitant with his more powerful bombardment unit. He received a report from Commander Eiji Sakuma, captain of the Iron Army, taking credit for the grievous damage inflicted on the American destroyer van. The elation on the Otago's bridge was squelched when word arrived from Admiral Hashimoto in the Sendai that the Iron Army had been terribly hit herself. Adrift northwest of Savo Island, she would finally sink when spreading fires detonated her torpedo battery, breaking her in two. As his widely roaming forces circled and sparred with Lee, Kondo seemed torn between two objectives, keenly aware that his mission was to suppress the airfield so as to give Tanaka's transports, steaming well to his north, a chance to land without further interference from the Cactus Air Force, Kondo kept the Kirishima and his two heavy cruisers interposed between Lee and the transports. Even as lookouts in the Atago and Takao insisted they had seen an American battleship among their opponents, Kondo discounted the possibility. He let his light forces carry the fight while awaiting his opportunity to throw the Kirishima at Henderson Field. Having learned from his destroyers that the fight was going well against the US cruisers, Kondo ordered Hashimoto to assist the damaged Ayanami. As Hashimoto turned north to comply, he encountered Admiral Kimura's destroyers, compelling them into a full circular turn to avoid a collision. Kondo's unwieldy task force organization thus turned and bit him. As the bombardment force, the Kirishima and the two cruisers, finally turned south to close on Henderson Field, both Kimura and Hashimoto found themselves out of the fight. Kondo had barely settled into his new heading when his lookout spotted the South Dakota and identified her as a cruiser. At the same time, the Nagara reported seeing two enemy battleships near Cape Esperance. The Atago's lookouts corrected their error in short order, announcing the presence of battleships. But it was only after his flagship searchlights swept over the compact and powerful form of the 42,000-ton South Dakota that Kondo himself finally grasped the nature of his opponent. All at once, both the Admiral and his flagship's commanding officer, Captain Matsuji Ijuin, began shouting orders to engage. Fixed by searchlights, the US battle wagon drew the immediate violent attention of every major ship in Kondo's force. The Japanese flagship Atago and her sister ship, the Takao, struck the South Dakota especially hard, repeated scoring with eight-inch fire from 5,000 yards. From the Atago, the Nagara and four destroyers, 34 long lances splashed into the sea. The Kirishima fired on Gatch's ship with her 14-inch battery from 11,000 yards, scoring with a hit at the base of her great after turret. The blast turned the surrounding deck planks into a storm of chips, incinerated the canvas gun bloomers, and cast fragments up and down the deck. A loader on the left gun inside the turret heard officers on the phones, wondering about the extent of the damage and whether the gun would still fire with an Olympian dent in her barbette. Our turret commander was certainly a cool-headed duck, he recalled. He said, never mind how bad we're hit. I don't give a damn if the guns blow up. I'm going to fire. There came a double buzz, followed by a long buzz, indicating the turret was about to discharge. The expectant seconds passed, but the great guns remained silent. With the main battery out, paralysed by the electrical failure, Gatch was able to respond only with his secondary battery. The battleship's five-inch guns jackhammered fiercely in local control, but were hardly a deterrent to heavy cruisers and a battleship. Topside, the South Dakota was taking the same kind of punishment that had turned the San Francisco's decks into a killing field two nights before. The wash of shrapnel made a sizzling sound as it sliced into cables, gun shields and steel decking. Well protected, though the engineering compartments were deep within the vital armoured box, no battleship's topside stations were proof against such firepower. More often than not, the armour-piercing rounds fired by Kondo's ships penetrated and passed through the superstructure plating without exploding. 
Still, the fires raged so fiercely that some enemy observers became convinced she was a goner. The barrage of hits to the South Dakota's superstructure shattered steam pipes going to the ship's whistle, and gusts of steam scalded many sailors in those exposed spaces. In Battle II, the executive officer, Commander A. E. Ulinger, refused to abandon station after it was engulfed in steam. In the end, the battleship's high foremast superstructure was poor shelter. It was a death trap. The chaplain, James Claypool, recalled hearing men praying. Some were so scared they couldn't remember the words to the Lord's Prayer. At such times everything you do is a prayer, a chief petty officer said. Even your cuss words are prayers. The South Dakota was designed for a different kind of fight, conducted at distances to the horizon and beyond, where her huge guns could kill at standoff range. At close ranges, the variables were too many to manage, and the risk was great. When an eight-inch shell exploded near an ammunition hoist, flashing through the opening and igniting some life jackets, a fire rose in a passageway adjacent to a handling room serving the five-inch battery. This small fire was a dangerous one, but it and the rest of the South Dakota's below-decks fires were quickly extinguished, and a disastrous secondary explosion was forestalled. It was Gatch's good fortune especially that none of the many torpedoes fired his way struck his ship, as her design was vulnerable below the waterline. Several long lances exploded prematurely on the way in. Topside, the flames danced. Willis Lee in the Washington had been patiently tracking a large target on his starboard hand, but since he had lost track of the South Dakota, owing to his blind spot astern, he dared not turn loose his big guns on this bogey, the Kirishima, until her identity could be verified. When the Japanese opened their searchlight shutters on the South Dakota, however, he had his answer. Lee's flagship enjoyed momentary concealment as she slid behind the burning Walker and Preston, which blinded Kondo to his presence. Here was an hour of truth, and the truth was this. Willis Lee was the contemporary master of radar fire control, and Washington's SG system gave him a clear electronic view of the oceanic battlefield under almost any circumstances. While sailors in open-air stations saw the horror of naval combat in the machine age with their own senses, steaming through the debris fields of the sunken destroyers, shouting out to sailors bobbing on rafts, nursing ghastly wounds, smelling the sweet tang of burned flesh. Inside, Officers with access to a radar image watched an abstract painting of the battlescape unfurl in a remorseless electric light. It was a picture cleansed of horror and emotion. Lee knew how to operate by it. He trained one group of his starboard side five-inch dual mounts on the Atago, and his main battery and the other group of five-inch mounts on the larger blip on his scope, the Kirishima. The Washington's unblinking electronic eyes nudged the main battery on target. From 8,400 yards body-punching range, as a Washington lieutenant put it, the South Pacific's battleship gunslinger emerged from the cover of his burning destroyers and turned loose with everything he had. Naval engineers who designed protective armour schemes for battleships calculated from the need to stop large-caliber direct gunfire from around 20,000 yards. But at close ranges, stopping a 16-inch projectile was hopeless. One of the South Dakota's turret officers, Paul Bacchus, exclaimed, throwing 14-inch and 16-inch shells at that kind of range, Jesus! Willis Lee had won the draw on the Kirishima. The last time Lee had held night spotting and gunnery practice was in January 1942, but since then he had drilled his crews in target selection and fire control procedures so thoroughly that it did not really matter whether it was night or day. An ensign named Patrick Vincent, stationed in the Washington's armoured conning tower, said, I was amazed at how well Captain Davis and Admiral Lee could function on the bridge with all the noise and blasting pressure from the guns. The racket was unbelievable. Even in the conning tower, it was almost impossible to communicate. The pressure from the gunfire spurting through open ports was knocking men down. It was nothing like what a battleship experienced on the receiving end of that fury. It had been just six minutes since the Kirishima's gunners had lost a solution on the South Dakota and checked their fire. Lookouts on the Atago, spotting the Washington, shouted, There is another ship forward of the first, a big battleship. Short seconds later, the lookouts were crying, Kirishima is totally obscured by shell splashes. According to Lee, the Washington's fire control and main battery 
functioned as smoothly as though she were engaged in a well-rehearsed target practice. The first salvo probably hit, and the second one certainly did. Ashore, roused from sleep by the heavy hammering of main batteries in the sound, Bill McKinney was among a team of Atlanta electricians stationed on a searchlight installation that stood watch over Guadalcanal's northern coast. Defended by a detachment of marines, the facility consisted of a tower of 60-inch searchlights with a diesel generator and a remote control director station. It was inoperable because its power cable had been slashed by overzealous foxhole diggers. Now, awakened, they were seized by the sight of battle. There was no telling who was friend or foe. It was like watching a baseball game without lineup cards, with everyone in the same colourless uniform. Ships revealed themselves suddenly with long gouts of flame and the bright parabolas of tracer rounds lazing through the night. The luminous red globes that seemed to float across the water knew no nationality. A few of them seemed to hover and disappear into the silhouette of a large ship which stopped firing. The Kirishima took a frightful battering from the Washington. The first hit destroyed the forward radio room located at the base of the foremast pagoda below the main deck. Shells smashed into the barbettes of her two forward 14-inch turrets, starting fires that threatened the magazines. The battleship's assistant gunnery officer, Lieutenant Commander Horishi Tokuno, ordered a forward powder magazine flooded to prevent fires. The rush of water caused the ship to list slightly to starboard. Another projectile hit the steering machinery room, flooding it and leaving the rudder jammed to starboard. After this, only the ship's inboard shafts were working, making it impossible to steer by reversing the outboard shafts. When hydraulic pressure failed in the after part of the ship, her two after-main gun turrets were left inoperable. Heat and smoke from topside fires, sucked into the ship by ventilation turbines, forced the evacuation of the engine rooms. A pair of 30-foot holes yawning in her deck amidships were the scars of this massive assault. On the Kirishima's bridge, Lieutenant Michio Kobayashi noticed the ship slowing and turning in a circle. The Kirishima's main battery managed to roar several times in return. The commanding officer, Captain Sanji Iwabuchi, thought his first salvo scored two hits, one of them blowing off the bridge of his target. At least ten hits were made upon them, but the enemy could not be finished off, he said. It was the familiar optimism of a warrior lost in a battle larger than he can comprehend. The 14-inch armor-piercing rounds passed like giant subway cars over the Washington's rigging. They must have been mighty close, a Washington sailor said, but an inch is as good as a mile. Ed Hooper's remorseless radars would have allowed no escape, even if the enemy ship retained the ability to maneuver. As the radar automatically lay the big rifles, the Washington's gun trains kept rolling, and the night rained murderously with heavy metal. The US flagship's rapid-firing secondary battery popped five-inch rounds into the Kirishima's pagoda foremast, stacks and superstructure, causing untold loss of personnel. When the officer in main battery control ordered the guns to cease fire, based on an erroneous report that his target had sunk, Captain Iwabuchi tried futilely to con the Kirishima away from the Washington, but we couldn't make way at all, he said. In the meantime, the engine rooms became intolerable because of the increased heat, and most of the engineers were killed, though they had been ordered to evacuate. Only the central engine could make the slowest speed. Fires brought under control gained strength again, so that the fore and aft magazines became endangered. Orders to flood them were then issued. Ninety seconds later, Captain Davis ordered his main battery, If you can see anything to shoot at, go ahead and the great guns opened up again on the Kirishima, whose gunners were able to respond with only her after turret. More hits obtained, the action reported declared. More than 200 sailors lay dead in the Kirishima, victims of a stem-to-stern pummeling by at least 20 16-inch shells from the Washington. Lieutenant Kobayashi believed the ship took half a dozen torpedoes as well, but these were most likely underwater hits. Many of the great 2,700-pound American projectiles struck short, but ploughed under the sea on flat trajectories to strike below the waterline. Admiral Lee, seeing their splashes, most likely counted these as misses, but they did by far the greatest damage to the Kirishima, all along her length. These underwater hits were Willis Lee's answer to the long-lance torpedo. After midnight, 
Kondo ordered his battered bombardment unit onto a westerly course. Only the Atago, lightly damaged, and the Takao, unhit, could comply. The Washington's radars tracked the Japanese ships as they withdrew. A light cruiser was fixed for the forward turrets and a destroyer for the after turret. But Lee, unsure of the South Dakota's location, would not allow the main battery to fire. Captain Gatch was fortunate to escape with a seaworthy battleship. The South Dakota had taken 26 hits, including 18 by 8-inch projectiles and one by a 14-incher. The damage wrought to the upper works was serious. With all of the ship's lights out, working parties operated by feel as they searched for the dead in the darkened foremast tower. They would not soon forget the things they found. Having lost track of the Washington, Gatch decided that his night was over. His battered ship alone was unable to carry the fight any longer. He elected to retire. This decision came as a relief to Willis Lee, who had pursuit on his mind and didn't need a wounded compatriot to worry about. The last report from Cactus Control at 7pm put five Japanese transports dead in the water about 15 miles north of the Russell Islands and four more limping northwest with a small combat escort. His big rifles not yet cool, Lee steered a course to intercept them the next day. The Washington had come through virtually unscratched by enemy fire. A five-inch hole in her giant bedspring air search radar transmitter was her only wound. She took a much worse thrashing from the blast of her own guns. Bulkheads caved in, compartments violently tossed, and a float plane left in ruins, suitable only for parts. Her only human casualties were a punctured eardrum and an abrasion to the back of a hand. She was the most powerful ship in these waters, but any ship alone is a vulnerable one. Shadowed by several of Kondo's destroyers, Glenn Davis rang the Washington's engine room to make emergency power, and his raging boilers piped enough steam to whistle up the four shafts to nearly 27 knots. At that speed, the 44,500-ton battleship, accelerating through a turn, cleaved wakes from her bow and stern that in collision generated wave peaks high enough to register on radar and spook her plotting officers that enemy ships were close in pursuit. When the Washington's radar registered real phantoms, small blips, presumably destroyers on the starboard bow, and when a smoke screen was sighted ahead, Captain Davis turned sharply right to avoid contact with a torpedo-wielding enemy. He continued turning until the flagship was headed south on course to retire. As he did so, large explosions raised great columns of water in her wake. He had turned away just in time. The battered Kirishima would not be saved. The light cruiser Nagara was nearby and Captain Iwabuchi requested a tow, but it was refused. The captain sent a radio message to Admiral Yamamoto, requesting that he order Nagara to tow the ship, but there was no time for intervention from Truk. The big vessel's list was just too severe. An attempt to prevent the flooding of the steering gear room also failing. The ship became hopeless, Iwabuchi said. The ship alternated listing to left and to right, as the free surface effect of floodwaters pulled her from side to side. Finally, the ship listed to starboard so badly as to make it impossible to stand on the bridge. Iwabuchi ordered Lieutenant Kobayashi to use a flashlight to signal the destroyers Asagumo and Teruzuki to come alongside, one to starboard, the other to port, to remove survivors. Officers in the wrecked and burning ship performed the earnest rituals of defeat, lowering the ensign to shouted banzais, transferring the Emperor's portrait to the Asagumo. As 1,100 souls were taken off the colossal wreck, the list was so severe that Iwabuchi had no choice but to scuttle her. His engineers opened the Kingston valves, attached to the bottom of her fuel tanks to enable cleaning, and the sea flooded in. Lieutenant Kobayashi had scarcely hopped over to the Asagumo when the Kirishima rolled hard and unexpectedly to port. The Asagumo freed her lines and pulled safely away. The captain of the Teruzuki had to order an emergency back full to avoid being capped by the turtling battleship's superstructure. With about 300 men still on board, the Kirishima joined the boneyard in Iron Bottom Sound shortly after 3 a.m. on November 15th, about 11 miles west of Savo Island. My men fought well and displayed the noble spirit of servicemen, Iwabuchi said. My only regret is that we could not sink the enemy in exchange for our ship. Before the two fleets parted ways and returned home, 
The Atago tried one final time to grapple with the American battle wagons. Captain Ijuin's ship launched a dozen torpedoes in three salvos, but these, fired at a poor angle astern their retiring target, never had a chance. The cruiser opened fire with her eight-inch main battery on the Washington from 15,000 yards, but this was a half-hearted final gesture from a force that had spent its fighting energies. Ijuin ordered a smokescreen and turned away to the north. The Washington's fire control specialists tracked the Atago and observed the flashes of her gunfire, but Admiral Lee and Captain Davis had had enough for one night too. They set course south and departed the battle area. Lee had good reason to be satisfied with his night's work. Beyond the hammer blows, he had landed on the Kirishima, the only battleship that would be sunk by another, one-on-one, -on -one, during the entire Pacific Campaign One. He knew that the Japanese troop transports, wherever they were, were too far away to reach Guadalcanal before sunrise, when Henderson Field's pilots, spared a thrashing from the sea, would be ready with a savage greeting. Lee directed the Gwyn and the limping Benham to head for Espiritu Santo, but the Benham would not make it. Her fractured hull put her at risk of floundering and losing her entire crew. The Gwyn scuttled her that night. Finally locating the South Dakota, which greeted them with the signal, I am not effective, Lee and Davis formed up with Gatch. Following behind, the Washington ploughed seas tainted with the South Dakota's bunker oil all the way back to Noumea. Shorn of the company of destroyers, the victorious American battle wagons, one riddled like a can on a stump with 39 fatalities, the other completely unscathed, rode beam to beam toward the comfort of their tropical home. Later, the South Dakota's captain would marvel at the fact that the battleships hadn't been hit by torpedoes. Gatch credited the destroyers for this. He thought they had indirectly deceived the Japanese. Judging by the swarms of torpedoes Kondo's escorts had fired at his van, Davis thought Kondo had mistaken the US destroyers for more lucrative targets. This probably saved the battleships being hit by torpedoes, he observed. When Lee asked Gatch afterward whether he felt the use of his destroyers had been proper in light of their near total loss, Gatch told him, as things turned out, I thought it was. This was cold testimony to the expendability of the destroyer force, which lost more than 200 men on the night of November 14 to 15. Lee appreciated their sacrifice. In breaking up the enemy destroyer attack, our destroyers certainly relieved the battleships of a serious hazard and probably saved their bacon, he wrote. At Noumea, the crews of the two battleships were far less generous with each other. Until the South Dakota departed for a stateside overhaul, they had more than a week to fight out the question of her combat performance in the bars and lockups. War was declared between the two ships. It was that simple, a Washington sailor said. Furious, Lee finally called a truce, issuing a special order of the day that stated, one war at a time is enough, and arranging for the two battleships to stagger their liberties ashore. Halsey's decision to throw his two battleships into the breach was vindicated by victory. It was the sort of risk that Nimitz had implicitly counselled against, and that Fletcher had forsworn with his carriers. Our battleships, Lee wrote, are neither designed nor armed for close-range night actions with enemy light forces. A few minutes' intense fire at short range from secondary battery guns can and did render one of our new battleships deaf, dumb, blind and impotent through destruction of radar, radio and fire control circuits. Halsey would say of his decision to send in Lee's battleships, how are all the experts going to comment now? The use we made of them defied all conventions, narrow waters, submarine menace and destroyers at night. Despite that, the books and the learned and ponderous words of the highbrows, it worked. Naval tacticians would find it tempting to undervalue what Lee accomplished that night, saying the Washington did what any modern battleship should do to a smaller specimen of the previous generation. But his victory was anything but an anticlimax foretold in a war lab, especially to the men who were there. Had Lee not confronted Kondo, the airfield would have been a feast for the IJN that night, and perhaps into the next morning. If Henderson Field had been neutralised, the Enterprise would have been the only source of US air power left in the combat area, and a feeble one at that. When the carrier retired south, she had only 18 Wildcat fighters on board. Her entire complement of Avengers and Dauntlesses had gone to operate with the Cactus Air Force at Henderson Field.
With the Battle of Giants over, Rear Admiral Tanaka turned the broad prows of his four navigable transports southward. Yamamoto himself endorsed Tanaka's plan to run the ships aground. It was around 4 a.m. when they beached themselves near Tassafaronga. Though they brought one last load into Starvation Island, they took themselves out of the war. These ships would be easy targets for attacks from air, land and sea. Set upon by the forces of nature in the ensuing decades, the wreckage of the transports would stand as symbols of Japan's futile determination to hold the Southern Solomons. From a force of more than 12,000 soldiers that Tanaka had originally embarked at Rabaul, only about 2,000 straggled ashore, along with 260 cases of ammunition and 1,500 bags of rice. Every one of more than 5,500 men Turner had transported to the island that week arrived safely. The numbers would spell victory. That morning on Guadalcanal, in the aftermath of the battle in the Sound, the outcome was still in doubt. Word went around to everyone holed up on the North Shore that if the Japanese had prevailed, their troops would be storming ashore before dawn. The news passed like a current among the electricians working to repair the power cables serving the remote control searchlight battery. This ruled out any further sleep, Bill McKinney wrote. When the familiar throaty rumble of USPT boats rolled in from the sound, it was safe to presume a victory. And when a report came in from the waterfront of enemy corpses floating in the water, uncountable multitudes of them, a sense of reassurance spread about the outcome. McKinney and his pals returned to work splicing cable, like ladies in a sewing circle. There were more than a few Americans out there on the swells. Survivors from the Walk and the Preston were among the oil-soaked throng revealed by the sunrise. Fighters on the morning patrol dipped down for a closer look, buzzing them to indicate their location to rescue boats. More than once, the pilot of an Army P-400 Aero Cobra bore down on a cluster of bobbing heads with his finger tensed on the trigger in case the survivors were enemy. The Guadalcanal campaign marked the onset, as far as US servicemen were concerned, of total war. Marine raider units, among others, were slaughtering prisoners rather than hauling them around. At sea and in the air, the same brutal ethic prevailed, no matter what the international accords required. These sailors breathed considerably easier after noon, when the destroyer Meade arrived from Tulagi, lowered boats and began taking them aboard. A pair of floatplanes left behind by Callahan's cruisers puttered around, inviting survivors to grab a pontoon strut for a ride to safety. Taken to the Mead, they fouled the destroyer's well-kept wardroom, now a triage with their blood. But the worst traumas of November reached waters far from Savo Sound. Most of the American sailors, who were still missing in action at that time, were beyond the reach of helping hands from Guadalcanal. An appreciation of the ordeal suffered by the survivors of the USS Juno would be gained only in retrospect, when nothing remained to be done for them. The fact that as many as 140 men had lived through the ship's sudden loss to a submarine torpedo on the morning of the 13th would surprise all who had witnessed her loss. The detonation of the Juno's powder magazine killed nearly everyone in her forward sections. Almost all those who survived were stationed in the after part of the ship. The survivors may have been spared by the fractured keel, whose wobbly state might have dissipated the blast wave as it flowed aft along the ship's spine. Spared was the wrong word for most of the men. Beneath a cloud of fuel oil vapours and powder smoke, they hit the waters in a squall of shattered steel, flying hatch covers and tumbling gun barrels and radar antennae, the hard gore of a warship that tore flesh and broke bone. One Juno survivor would estimate that two-thirds of his surviving shipmates who hit the water alive had received serious wounds. According to Alan Hine, some of them were in very bad shape, their arms and legs were torn off, and one of them, I could see myself his skull. You could see the red part inside where his head had been split open, you might say torn open in places. The next morning, Hayne noticed that his hair had turned grey just as if he was an old man. Shortly after the Juno's loss that morning, Gilbert Hoover had signalled her final coordinates to the pilot of a B-17 flying fortress that happened by overhead, with a request to relay the information to Noumea. The pilot counted some 60 souls in the water and dropped a balsa life raft. His message to Halsey, however, took untold hours to be decoded, read and acted upon. 
It was these sailors' vast misfortune to be cast adrift at a time when the Navy was gathering its resources for Lee's fight with Kondo. Search planes were scouring not the northern Coral Sea, but the approaches to Guadalcanal. All available ships had been pressed into service, either as convoy escorts or in a task force, and so the Juno's survivors bided their time. Addled by fatigue and exposure, some of them let go of the raft and swam below to search their ship's passageways for something dry to eat. One of these survivors, George Sullivan, paddled around calling out for his four brothers, long gone. The oldest and highest-ranked Sullivan must have felt he had let his little brothers down. For his other shipmates, suffering the agonies of brine-swollen tongues, sunburned shoulders, bloated limbs, delirium and the predations of sharks, he did what he could. When George found some survivors who were unrecognisably fouled in bunker oil, he swiped the faces with gobs of toilet paper, looking for the familiar facial features of his kin beneath layers of drying fuel. Alan Hayne, on the raft with Sullivan, fought to overcome a powerful impulse to swim to the ship that he thought he sensed hovering below. He recovered in time to save another man from this delirium. Hain held on to him for a time, long enough for the man to give up all struggles. He was preparing to surrender the deceased man to the sea when he found himself standing athwart the fierce resolve of the Irishman from Waterloo, Iowa. You can't do that, Sullivan said. It's against all regulations of the Navy. You can't bury a man at sea without having official orders from some captain or somebody like that. These words were spoken with the unshakable certitude of a scrambled mind. Hayne was considering his argument, holding on to the corpse, half on the raft and half in the sea, when a shadow moved below the surface. The dead man lurched and one of his legs was carried away, ending the argument. George Sullivan was left on the cusp of uncharted oblivion, still calling for his brothers, his fevers and delusions a merciful sedative to grief. That night, four days after his ship had been turned to particles, he left the company of his shipmates. Stripping off his clothes, he said he was going to take a bath, then floated away, paddling to the place where another deep shadow rose, mercifully ending the nightmare. 